On today's show, the San Diego Padres get a much needed bounce back win after that debacle on Sunday behind one Sir Chef U Darvish and a huge offensive performance from the team capped off by a Luis Campizano bases clearing double. And then is Robert Suarez officially like, do we got to put him in the elite tier of closers? All that and more. Let's get into it. You are locked on Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres Podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Tuesday, May 7th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You may be familiar with my baseball-related work over at the site Just Baseball, where I write about not just the Padres, but baseball in general. I will be writing about the Padres actually probably today by the time you're listening to this. So look forward to that. And also, you can find me on my new show, Baseball vs. the World, for general silliness on all baseball topics. Talking about Scott Boris power quotes, rankings, or whatever news. So check, check that out if you want. But of course, follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Because if you do, you got to see my reactions to the Padres going absolutely nuts in this game. Um, just a much needed win, especially after Sunday. And it's funny. Um, someone had actually tweeted at me uh, because I put out there that uh, Jerickson Profar, in terms of WRC Plus, was heading into last night. I assume that it's it hasn't changed too much, but I had actually put it out that the leaders in WRC Plus this year are number one, Shohei Otani, two, Mookie Betts, three, Alec Bohm, and then four, Jerickson Profar. And someone was saying like, oh, and let me actually get your at real quick, my good man. Hopefully I could find it. Um, Gavin at Padres Hub was like, hey, I mean, this is great and all, but like he literally replaced Juan Soto and we are still a game under 500. Well, not anymore, right? So we're going to talk all about all of that for sure on today's episode, guys. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockdownMLB and use code all lowercase LockdownMLB for a first deposit match up to $100, ladies and gentlemen. Look, look. And here's the thing. My thing with the Padres in general is I think that you should assess the team, and this is how I respond to my, my friendly pal Gavin, is that I think that while the Padres have been frustrating in a lot of levels, um, particularly with the starting pitching, I think, although that wasn't the case last night, I just think that it's better to evaluate individual players versus the record. And if you look at it before last night, they were one game under 500, which isn't bad. This isn't, you know, basketball. This isn't, you know, football especially. You know, th it, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot because they could rip off a sweep and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, there are a few games over 500 now. And also, they're just a half game back of the wild card. So I wouldn't focus too much, me personally, on the standings and the overall record at the moment. I think you could start doing that maybe at the end of this month. We could potentially do that. Two months of baseball, I think it's fair to start looking at, like, if the Padres are three games under 500, that's that's worth looking into. But teams go and runs all the time in the schedule, ebbs and flows, all that stuff. So, um, And this is what I was saying. Like, you got to believe. And here, they absolutely proved me right because I would have looked stupid if I put that tweet out and then they ended up playing poorly. In this game, being led by one Sir Yu Darvish, who looked pretty dang good. His second start since coming off the IL. And he was fantastic. And both starts since... since um, uh, I think both starts since coming off the IL, right? April 14th, April 3rd. Is this his third start off the IL? I'm confused. I'm confused. April 3rd, April 14th. I think it's... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was his second start coming off the IL. I'm, I'm forgetting. It's seven days. Duh. Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, his second start coming off the IL. Neither start has he given up a run. In this one, five innings, three hits, no earned runs, though. One walk, five strikeouts. Against a Cubs lineup that is okay. I don't think it's been fin like fantastic this year, but they are six in runs and eleventh in home runs, so they definitely got some some batters in that lineup for sure. And you saw that they did eventually later in this game, getting some hits. Um, he looked solid. Um, he got eight whiffs on his slider, which was really impressive, and he got three on eleven swings on his fastball. And then, as you know, with Darvish, he threw some sinkers, he threw some sweepers, he threw some knuckle curves, he threw some cutters, he threw some curveballs, he threw some splitters. He's got like eighty-seven pitches. And while every now and then, now you can't always argue with the results. Every now and then, and I think there was an article uh, written by Andy McCullough in The Athletic a few years ago, which basically talked about, like, one criticism that one might make of Darvish and one, say, 
uh, negative that some people will say with some of the reasons that he may struggle sometimes is that he just has such a crazy pitch mix that he should focus on the ones that he's the best with as opposed to trying to have you know 18 different pitches like he's got a bunch of different weapons like he's playing ratchet and clank if anyone has ever played those games where you just have a bajillion crazy weapons that you can upgrade and all that and you just whoop them out of nowhere yes i'm still a nerd guys um but regardless it seems to work and i've been saying it for a while not i'm not even like trying to toot my own horn that i really do think that you darvish comes down to just health i really really do his era on the season is now low key Low key 2.94. And while I am worried about the Padres starting pitching, one of the reasons I think it's looked really bad of late is because they did lose Darvish for 15 days. Like they had lost him for a little bit. So as a result, you got more starts that became more glaring because you were like, uh. but in reality, basically the whole year, he's been okay. Don't get me wrong. He hasn't been awesome sometimes. The last time he pitched against the Cubs, he gave up four earned runs in three innings. That wasn't great. But as long as he's healthy, which is a big if, I have the utmost faith and confidence that you Darvish can be effective. Don't get me wrong, I'm not that doesn't mean that I I still don't like the contract. Um not because I think that the average annual is like horrible or anything like that. I understand like the decision to be like, "Hey, we don't have a lot of ready farm system prospects. We still want to give Lesko and Snelling and Mazer and others some time." But I do think that it's still like not the best deal because I don't know why you had to do that. I don't know who you're competing with. And I, I mentioned this with Jay Cronenworth. But as of right now, look, if anyone can age well, it's you, Darvish. And he looked really, really sharp. And yes, he only went five innings, 83 pitches. But I like that. I mean, he's just coming off the IL. You don't want to push him too hard, especially because we've seen how much his health stuff affects his starts. Even when he's available sometimes, he, if he's got a little bit of an injury, it can affect him. 2021 showed us, showed us that in the second half and all of 2023 basically showed us that, which is that if he's dealing with some injuries, then it's almost every time he's struggling for an extended period of time, it seems to always coincide with an IL stint of sorts. That's at least what I've noticed, um, or at least some reports. So like 2021, I don't think he was on the IL, but he, it was like mentioned a lot that he had like this really bad back issue. And that explains why he completely tanked in the second half. So all health for me when it comes to you, Darvish. And otherwise, um, I'm really confident in the guy. And having him back, especially after losing Musgrove, and especially seeing him look healthy in these past two starts is huge. And Musgrove, what I do really like, I didn't mention, I think I briefly mentioned on yesterday's episode that Musgrove, it was viewed as precautionary. Musgrove himself said like he'd be able to give it a go um, in the San Diego Union Tribune article um, done by Kevin Acey, that he'd be able to, you know, if it was later in the season or potentially a playoff game, he'd be able to go, which is good news. Um, so hopefully Musgrove, there isn't like any giant injury. I know I put out that meme on Twitter about birth being an accursed and existence is a prison from the good place, but hopefully that's not too long. Darvish, though, coming back immediately looking great. Hopefully the rest of the Padres rotation could kick in the gear with Michael King and, you know, maybe Randy Vasquez can show us some stuff and hopefully Dylan Cease keeps it up, which I think he will, but hopefully that all goes well because... I think the Padres pitching is the only, it's like not the only problem, but it's been the biggest thing with this team so far is just, you don't know what you're getting from your starters aside from Cease. And that's not great. And I don't like that everyone was jumping on Waldron. It's been really inconsistent all over the place, but love what he did last night very much. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't the only thing. Uh -uh. We got some, I, I alluded to it in the opening. The Luis Campuzano hive has simply never been stopped ever. Ignore the defensive miscues from last week. He has simply never been stopped, folks. But before we talk about that, I need to stop for one second and take a break to talk to you guys about the best fantasy baseball app. It's not just fantasy baseball, though. It's all fantasy. It's daily fantasy sports. And that is, of course, uh, our friends over at Prize Picks, the number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's easy. And it's almost definitely exciting. And you just have to pick more or less on two or more player stats and just watch those winnings roll in. Obviously, baseball's underway. You want to go over on Tatis' home runs? You want to go over on tomorrow's starter? Who is it? So it's Darvish, so it should be, I believe it's it should be Randy now, right? Yeah, because he's replaced Musgrove. You want to go over on innings for Randy Vasquez? You can do that. Shoto Imanaga. He's been all the rage for Chicago, and now the Padres are going to face him. So, hey... 
they killed Yamamoto, maybe they could kill this guy. Maybe the Padres are becoming rookie killers. Maybe that's what they can do. Uh, but regardless, you can pick on any players, whatever you want, over-unders on stats. And we've got the playoff basketball. We've got the playoff hockey. We've got WNBA just around the corner. There is all sorts of stuff out there. The sports be sporting. You know what I mean? So go check that out. And also, if you get any injuries or anything like that, say a batter, for example, gets two or, le- um, or less appearances, then that won't count as a loss for you. So they also have injury protection, which is great. Um, go check it out, guys. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB when you download the app for a deposit match up to $100. Again, that is LOCKEDONMLB. Download the app. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. But folks, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. And we're still a little bit on the money theme, but we're on the the more fun side, the less sport-wise of money stuff, and that is with our good friends over at Monopoly Go. I've been talking about this game a lot because I like that there's so many, it's just a modern twist on a game everyone's heard of, you know what I mean? And I love it when they do that. You know, I remember when the Tetris 99 game came out, uh, when some, I'm blinking, but there's there's so many other games out there that they put modern twists. Hey, my buddy Pac-Man, y'all ever pay Pac-Man Championship Edition? Oh, those games are fun and you feel like you are in the middle of a rave when you play those games. And Monopoly Go gives me that same sort of vibe, which is revitalizing the game. They've got all these like different dynamic boards. They've got plenty of disrespectful things. You can work with your friends and team up to climb the leaderboards, different tournaments, earn different rewards. They can help you get all these different emojis. You can, I mentioned the dynamic boards. You've got the wrecking ball to just destroy your opponent. I wish you could just flatten their, their like, they're like thing, you know, what is it called? The game piece, you know what I mean? That They've got all these different game pieces too. It's a modern twist and they've got so many different multipliers and rewards and titles for you to go into. So go check it out. There's always fun to discover in Monopoly Go. Now free on the Google Play or App Store. Go check it out. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back on the Lockdown Padres podcast. Remember to get the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, of course, including the old YouTube, if you like to see my smugly, wuggly, ugly face. Whatever you want. Go check that out. Um, let's continue, though. In terms of the rest of the game, actually, I mean, I spent a lot talking about Darvish. Um, for the Cubs, Justin Steele making his return, and he wasn't, like, electric or anything, but it was the second start of the season, and he shut down the Padres pretty great. Uh, that's Look, the Chicago Cubs as a team... If I had previewed, their big thing is bullpen right now. They just don't have a bullpen, but their starting pitching can be very effective. As I mentioned with Imanaga, and getting Justin Steele back for them is going to be a really good plus for them. Um, And he was good. Four and two thirds, only gives up um, three hits, no earned runs, one walk, two Ks. Pretty solid return start for him. Um, And he's genuinely, I mean, he was, I believe he was second or third. or I'm sorry, he was third in Cy Young voting last year. Like, he's really good, so... That doesn't surprise me, but the game is basically quiet all the way until the end. Uh, And don't get me wrong, the Pirates did have some moments uh, early on that they could have done better. I think there was a couple pitches of steals that they should have done a little bit better with. Like, you know, Tatis, not the best game for him um, that we've had. He's been very, like, he keeps teasing us with the explosion. You know what I mean, Tatis? He's been teasing us with it, but he hasn't quite delivered fully. Uh, One for five in this game with a strikeout, but he does get a stolen base, which was nice. Um, But... We have to wait all the way until the sixth inning in which the Padres go absolutely nuts. Jerks and Profar, huge RBI with runners on second and third. Big shouts, though, to the gutsy call to have a double steal in that situation, especially with someone like Jay Cronenworth, who isn't like a speedster. He's a good base runner, but I don't think he's like a speedster or anything like that. He rarely steals bases, but double steal for Profar, and he comes through. Profar has been amazing all damn year, as everybody knows. He's been fantastic, and I think that one of the things with the Padres is they've just been already so much better than they were last year with runners in scoring position. He's, I mean, Profar has been, like, a genuine phenomenon. He's got a 1.6 F4, which is, like, up there among all players, and what's been happening, I think, this year is that he's just been hitting fastballs better. Uh, He's been hitting fastballs better, and while he does swing and miss a little bit, he's offset that with the fact that he's hitting the ball well. Um, And I don't, and I think that we've, we've reached a point where... I mentioned that you can't really look into the standings, in my opinion, yet. You can look at individual players and stats, I think. I think we can start doing that. Um, Maybe not on a team level, but on the individual, like, analyzing different player level. And that's how I feel about Profar, where my thing is, 
Yes, he started off hot the last time he was with the Padres in 2022, but this year he's starting off hot on a level that's very different. The expected results are not that much lower. They're a little bit lower, but like I don't think he's going to have a 450 on base, for example. But they're not that much lower, so I'm really starting to think that Profar might have discovered something, which is crazy, by the way. In high leverage situations, guys, this year, low leverage, he's been fine, medium leverage. In high leverage situations this year, Jerkson Profar has a 326 WRC+. plus. I just want to give you that, like, just throw that out there. That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. And judged by fan graphs, they call that 14 at-bats he's had in high leverage situations. He's in a 571 I like, I like using WRC+, plus, but he's been unbelievable for this team. And I think that while the clutch, that he's not going to have a 326 in high leverage. That's like, he's not going to be 300% better <laughs> in high leverage situations. That's crazy. But I'm starting to really think, guys, that this might be legit. But more legit also is that the inning doesn't end there. They bring in another reliever, our buddy Richard Lovelady, and he comes in, gives up a single to Xander Bogarts, and then Donovan Solano, who I forgot to mention, making his Padres debut at third base. Uh, Manny Machado gets the day off today, and he delivers two for three on the night with an RBI and a walk. Donovan Solano, kind of Luis Arise coded, dare I say, in a lot of ways. Not the same offensive ability like... Luis Arise, like, at his best, is just going to get on base, like, literally every single time. Um, some days, like, as you saw in his Padres debut. But Donovan Solano, I love the mix and match potential that this team has. You saw that they also took out Donovan Solano for Tyler Wade as a pinch runner. That's what I think Tyler Wade's good for. So, again, I mentioned this on yesterday's episode, but I think that's why he's staying in the in, on the team. And I, I'm cool with that decision. Um I'm cool with that decision because of the Arise trade and because he's he's hit a little bit better lately. He's not slugging the ball at all, but because he can be a little bit of a pest and, he, and he's fast. So I do like that. Um, but Donovan Solano, he has done nothing except hit for years, ever since he revitalized himself in San Francisco. And it wasn't like a one-year revitalization, which is why when they claimed him, I think people were so... Padres fans were very like, you know, call him up, let's go. But since that 2019 season, has not had a WRC plus below 100, 116 that first year, then 125, 105, 100, and then 116 last year. Um, not a great defender, but he's also going to be able to get on base, draw some good walks. So I think that the mix and match potential with this lineup, the fact that you don't have to have, like, there are going to be days where I imagine they're going to move Jake Cronenworth around. Maybe they'll put Arise at first base. Maybe they'll move Solano around. Maybe they'll, you know what I mean? Like, I just think that there's so many fun benefits pieces on this team the depth is real guys even for Campizano right even for someone like Luis Campizano who's really struggling defensively they have Kyle Higashioka for some of those so you and he deserves some playing time because he's a much better defender this Padres team has the most depth of any team that I've been covering over these last five years and I'm serious does it have the same star power of course not because Soto last year you lose him don't get me wrong not the same level of star power but for me I look at this and say the depth is there um, and there's potential reinforcements. We've already seen Jeremiah Estrada get called up. We've seen that Robbie Snelling and Adam Mazur could be called up at some point. Hopefully later on, I want to give them more time. Um, but that's what's really good, is that you also have some potential reinforcements to buff the team. This is why having depth matters, because it's not that you shouldn't sign superstars. You should, because that's the only way you're going to win uh, the thing that matters, the World Series. But... You need some depth. You need some options just in case some sort of injury, some sort of players who are underperforming that you could bring in. Heck, at this rate, who knows if Xander Bogarts gets benched at some point and you bring in Donovan Solano or you bring in Arise at that position. We'll have to see. I just love that they have so many mix and match. Would I like if maybe you had a little bit more depth in the outfield? Yes, I think that that might be a little bit of a thing, but I'm okay with it for now. You could always bring in a Zokar as a defensive replacement, all that sort of stuff. I think we're good. I just really like how this team has been playing. Um, and then Luis Campizano with the date bases loaded. Forgot to mention this. After Solano brings in Jerks and Profar, Campizano comes up and he delivers uh, really good stuff after Hassan Kim drew the walk. Merrill strikes out swinging, Arias grinds out, and then Tatis grinds out. So they don't get any more than that. But even still, to get that big hit from your catcher, it's just really weird watching a guy who can hit as a catcher. And by the way, it's not going to stop. I stand by that. Now, is he going to be a little bit annoying at the plate because he doesn't take walks? Yes. And he's not going to get on base at enough of a clip. But bottom line is he is a plus offensive catcher. And I believe that the average, I'm going to say like the, I'm very much averaging right now. I don't have it in front of me. I'm going to pull it up. Is like last year, I believe, 
uh, for catchers, the average WRC plus was um, what's it called? Um, was like 89. I believe that was the average last year. Um, and so far for this team, um, you know, he's been he's been huge. It's really cool after all these years with your Mejias and your Hedges that they have someone who can actually kind of hit a little bit. WRC plus on average for catches this year, by the way, is 100. And Luis Campizano, as of right now, has a... Let me just pull this up real quickly because I don't have it on me. He has a 110 WRC plus, so he's better. And by the way, that's going to go down a little bit, um, I imagine. There's been a lot of good catcher play, I feel like, this year. But anyway... Enough of that, though. Shouts to Campizano. Was it a little bit annoying when, say, I do have some nitpicks. End of the end of the game, Jackson Merrill getting caught. Not great, right? We don't love that. Getting caught with two outs. Don't love to see, or not two outs, with no outs and a 3-2 count to arise. I get it if it's like 1-0 or if it's 0-1. But when it's 3-2, just I would let the next pitch pass. You know what I mean? I get what he's trying to do because Arise could get a single and score Merrill. But, hey, he's a kid. It's fine. You know what I mean? He also got a big hit in this game at some point, so... We're okay. We're okay with that. Merrill's just been a slight slump. He's hitting a little bit of rookie wall, but it's fine. Um, but that's basically it um, in terms of offense, except for one last thing. We are beginning, ladies and gentlemen, the X-Watch. Of course, I'm referring to Xander Bogarts. Low-key might be turning it around, right? Three doubles in his last four games. What has been the thing that's been an issue with him? No lift, no power, all that stuff. So he's getting some doubles. So... You like to see that. Three doubles in his last four games. He's on the X watch. That does not mean I think he's back or anything. I'm not even getting excited. I'm just throwing it out there. Keep an eye on that. Maybe the lower leverage, maybe the lower position in the lineup could be really good for him. We'll have to see. We'll have to see, ladies and gentlemen. But I want to talk about a little bit more about the pitching and specifically the bullpen, folks. And one Sir Robert Suarez before we close out this podcast, guys. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about something else. That always delivers. Speaking of Robert Suarez, I'm talking about food delivery, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about my friends and pals over at DoorDash. We love DoorDash. We really do. DoorDash is one of the great things to ever walk this earth, some might even say. No one has said this, but I'm saying it right now. And with DoorDash, folks, look, whether it be groceries, whether it be and your and random antiques, I don't know, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, food, whether it be flowers, you know, we got Mother's Day coming up this weekend. If you want to get, you know, maybe you're already planning your own gift. What about a surprise gift where you're like, hey, mom, guess what else is coming in? I just bought a bunch of flowers or I bought chocolate. DoorDash has you covered with all of that. And right now you can get 50% off your next order up to $15 when you spend $15 or more on your next flower, convenience, grocery or retail order now on DoorDash. Really good stuff, guys. And like I said, that deal, you got to take advantage of it for Mother's Day with the code locked on MLB. Order using DoorDash, DoorDash, DoorDash today. Terms do apply. Go check it out. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Let's do this one more time here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. Remember, go follow me on Twitter at Javipeno, J A V I I P E N O. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts from. Let's talk some bullpen, folks. And that's what made this game scary. I know dang well that a lot of y'all were watching this game going, oh no, the, the, the PTSD from that Rockies game came roaring back. And you're like, Javi, why do you keep telling us this bullpen is good? I don't trust it. Look, man, bullpen has off days too. The Padres being up 6-0 in this game at one point, and then the bullpen kind of gave up some runs. But it's okay, because if you look at it like this, Yuki Matsui, I've been talking about him a little bit where he doesn't have as much swing and miss stuff. I think that his fastball is just being tatted a little bit too much um, for my liking. But the splitter has been the good news, which is like his ace pitch. The fact that batters haven't really hit that this year is a really good sign, um, in my opinion. It just means that he has to work on some of the other stuff. For, so, for example, this year he's thrown... The slider, 16% of the time, batters aren't hitting that. And his split finger fastball, which is the thing he throws the most, 37.6% of the time, opponents are hitting 136. The problem is the, is the fastball, 333 batting average against. So that does get tatted a little bit, and he doesn't always trust it. But because he's got a mixture of pitches, and I think he's working on some of the others, right, um, that I think he'll be okay. But I think that there were some things. For example, expected batting average against the sweeper is 302. 
And that isn't his most used pitch, but he uses it 8.9% of the time. His you know, expected ERA was a little bit higher. It does not surprise me that he gave up a home run to someone like Christopher Morrell, who, by the way, is like going nuclear lately, low key for the Cubs. Why is this guy like a superstar slugger? He's got, let me see here. He's got four home runs in his last five games. Like Christopher Morrell is going absolutely nuts. Low key, like a, a slugger kind of player uh, developing over there in Chicago. So it doesn't surprise me. He was due, I think, in a lot of ways. And while he is a little bit shaky at times, and his ERA doesn't look great now at 3.38, that's just kind of what happens when you get hit by, you know, a big home run. So that's fine. It was 2.35 before that. I'm not surprised by this. I just think he needs a little bit more time to adjust, learn some things, because again, with the expected ERA, with the fact that his walk rate, I believe, for a lot of this season was higher than his strikeout rate, with the fact that I mentioned the expected batting average of sweeper, I'm not surprised by this, but it's okay. They were up 6 nothing. It didn't happen in like a high leverage situation. This is what you want from your bullpen. When your guys have like sub-1 ERAs, you're like, hey, we're up by 8. Get it out of your system now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like You're like, all right, get it out of your system now. It won't hurt us that much. The Padres didn't put together the best offensive, like, you know, just productive outs, I don't think, um, after the bullpen had blown it a little bit. But it's all good. We still won the game. Um, and Del Santos, another guy who's been electric this year. Raising his ERA from 1.98 to 2.45. Look, he'd been really good lately, though. Uh, and he's been good for a lot of this season. He's had games where he's had three strikeouts, four strikeouts. So I'm not worried about him. That move has been so, so good. He's really underrated, man. Past three years, 1.98 ERA this year, 3.29 last year, 3.04 last year. Like, he's clearly figured some things out. Maybe there were some naysayers who were like, that was just Cleveland, and Cleveland tends to do this with a lot of guys. They found Class A, for example. They found Karen Chak, for example. But it's been such a big move for the Padres to save money when they needed to save money um, on Scott Barlow and getting Daniel De Los Santos in exchange. Just a really genuinely underrated, savvy, small ball tertiary move from AJ Preller that he deserves credit for. Um, I love that trade when it happened and it has aged well. It's okay that Santos got hit up a little bit. And then after that, Wandy Peralta. I really think that Wandy Peralta, out of all the like guys they've invested in, he's been the most weird because I don't like that he's not striking guys out. And he's he gave up two walks in this game. He comes in, gives up a double, and then a walk. Wandy Peralta's look shaky. And he's weird because his last season with the Yankees, his expected stats were through the roof, but then his ERA was low. But then the previous year, his ERA was a little bit higher and his expected stats were much lower. So I don't know which version of Wandy Peralta is real is basically what I'm getting at. Hopefully he's good. Hopefully. Um, but I didn't like how you're supposed to come in and take over and you did not do effectively. So I thought it was okay that Schilt pulled him. Then they brought in Jeremiah Estrada, which for the record... I think was was okay, but he clearly struggled a little bit. He, I think the moment got to him, but getting that one strikeout was huge, and I think it was great that Schilt pulled him and brought in Suarez, which brings us to the last thing that I got to talk about. Robert Suarez, is he in the elite tier? Um, look, this Padres bullpen, man. And by the way, four-seam fastball on, on Jeremiah Estrada was like up in velo. It was like 97.2, like on average, like maxed out at 97.9 I'm like you he, he was cooking guys he's cooking we might have something here but with Robert Suarez who's also velo is up I kind of love that this dude's entire thing is just throwing fast <laughs> like he's not as like like um crafty as some other closures the Padres have had this is not Mark Melanson this is not even Josh Hader um although he's been much better than Josh Hader Whoa, go look up his numbers um three strikeouts and one and two thirds Probably won't be available tomorrow because of that, but it was worth it, I think, especially because in a high leverage situation, I'm really glad they took out Estrada, even with the strikeout he got. Even with the strikeout, you weren't tempted to leave him in there. Young guy, rookie um, scenario, right? Like, that's high leverage. Let's pull in, bring in our veteran, bring in our highly paid closer, gets the strikeout. Just awesome, awesome stuff from Robert Suarez, saving the game for the Padres for sure. That fastball, man, when it's on, it's got some bite to it. And someone actually has been tweeting at me over these last few weeks. Uh, I want to make sure I get your name right on Twitter real quick. Um, my buddy, not not my buddy, but uh, who's been tweeting at me lately, asking, like, how is Robert Suarez not elite? And he's been saying this so much. And then he tweeted at me the other day, at SD to Las Vegas, shouts to you, sir, saying elite. And he just posted the picture that everyone's been doing this lately, by the way, for people watching on YouTube, the, like, MLB.com 
like stat profile. You know what I mean? I've just been really enjoying that. That's the thing that seems to get engagement lately. Um, tied for fourth in saves in Major League Baseball. He's probably actually higher now. Um, I didn't even check that. Uh, in terms of saves, let me see if Fangraphs updated. It hasn't updated. So he is now tied with Clay Holmes, Kyle Finnegan, and Ryan Helsley uh, with the most saves in baseball. And Emmanuel Classe is right behind him. He's been great. His ERA is one of the lowest in Major League Baseball. There has been a little bit of a lack of whiffs, so that's why I love to see him generate four on 11 swings with that fastball today. And also the fact that he just got the three strikeouts, right? And that's been my thing, which has been why I don't think that he's in like the top, top tier of closers, just because my thing was like, hey, his whiff stuff fell off last year. So I was wondering, but he's looked a lot sharper this year. And I love the way he just like challenges hitters sometimes. That was really great. Whiffed it by them. Really good stuff. His ERA currently um, among all qualified relievers is tied for, I believe, ninth in Major League Baseball. And the expected stats aren't bad on it either. 2.76 expected ERA, 3.38 FIP. X FIP at 3.85 is a tiny bit high, higher than I would have liked, but it's okay. I don't really care about war for pitchers. I've said this before. I just don't like it because it it takes too much of the expected stats into account in my personal opinion. Maybe I'm getting this wrong. I don't like that because it's like Snell had like a lower war than like guys who had like a 3.8 ERA last year. And I'm like, well, what happened on field? How can you be worth less wins when you literally didn't give up as many runs. So I don't like that. I don't like it for pitchers. I like it for position players. Um, but hey, whatever, he came through. Low war, I don't really care. At least his XFIP isn't through the roof. So for example, I'll give you an example of someone who right now has a little bit more questionable stats just from the, the initial look at. Tim Heron of the Cleveland Guardians, 0.59 ERA, but an expected 4.05 and an XFIP of 4.31. So that just gives you an idea of like, oh, that guy might be due. Robert Suarez, yeah, he'll be due. I don't think he's going to have a sub ERA of one all season, but hopefully he gets it out of his stomach and gives up like a solo shot when we're already up by four or something like that, and then we're good. So shots to Robert Suarez, and most importantly, he showed that first year when he was with the Padres that he was great. And I'm going to take a little bit of a victory lap. Your boy, just a little bit of one. One of the reasons why, and I was one of the... No, I can't say I was only the only. I don't know what people's reactions were. But one of the reasons I like the Robert Suarez extension, well, I don't like all in all, as I've mentioned many times before, that they extended everyone under the sun except for Juan Soto. I don't understand why you did that. But one of the reasons I like the Suarez extension, we can debate whether or not you thought his rookie season was that good and he would continue to be good. My thing was, this is them saying, we think Robert Suarez is a top-level closer, and we are not, and we think that by the end of next year, he's going to cost even more, and we think we might be losing Hayter. That's why I like the deal. I like the deal because I think it was the Padres saying, we have someone who we think can be just as good or better than Josh Hayter, and we can get him for less, even though they'll still be paying him. You know, the four years, four, I forgot what his deal is, like four years, 45, I believe. Um that we think we can get this guy less than what someone like uh, Josh Hader is going to get. And they made that calculus, and so far, it has been awesome. Let me just check really quickly. His base salary, yeah, $10 million. It was four years, uh, five years, $56 million. So that's that's big time. Like He's one of the highest paid relievers out there, but they saved a lot. So this is a huge, huge plus uh, for the team, I think, and it needs to be brought up, versus um, five years, 95 for Josh Hader. Little things like that matter as long as you're spending, right? I don't like it when teams that aren't spending anything are like, look at us. We got production for less. It's like, yeah, but your budget, your payroll is still like 50 million, so you're not going to win. So with the Padres, definitely deserve some credit. That's why I like that move because I thought it was them saying, this guy's just as good. Let's pay him now, and he won't cost as much as Hater. And Hater's been falling apart, so just throwing it out there. Relievers can still be volatile, so I'm not saying that Suarez will keep this up forever, but... As of right now, it looks like he's returned to what he was like in 2021, and that is, or 2022, and that is just a godsend, and I'm grateful for it. So, shouts to Robert Suarez. I am officially placing you in the elite tier of all relievers in baseball. Seriously, that good. That fastball, man. I love seeing that fastball sometimes. But, ladies and gentlemen, 
That about does it for today's edition of Lockdown Potties Podcast, the only pod that may be better than the pot Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Send me your questions on there. You can tweet at me, whatever you want. Sometimes, even if it's not a question, I'll just use it on the show because that's what I'm like. I always keep y'all on your toes. You know what I mean? So look forward to that. Tomorrow's episode is going to be recapping the game. Going to be doing that all week. Um, might have a guest on for Thursday, but we'll see. Until that moment, though, guys, and until next time, stay safe and, of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.